and we're live. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rusty Sos Teachers Month, Mind, Brain, and Education SIG event on Second Language Acquisition for Adults. Nati, can they all hear me now? We're live and we can hear you. That's good. So a big welcome to all of you who's who's joined us here today after lunch. Therefore, the coffee for you, <laughs> it should be needed. We don't want anybody drowsy here in the afternoon with us today. So go get your coffee, your cup of coffee, your glass of water, and we'll be starting right at 1 p.m. local time. We are, uh, I am in Sao Paulo, so it's minus three GMT. Okay, we'll be with you in a few minutes.
Okay, it's 1 p.m. now, so we are on the hour, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Mind Brain Education Special Interest Group webinar on Second Language Acquisition by Adults. Today we have this schedule, as you already know, uh, with the um, information given by the platform, the registration platform, and our social media channels. So in the first 15 minutes, you'll be with me for an introduction and an overview. Then after that, one by one, each of the panelists today will be with you presenting their content on second language acquisition by adults for a quarter of an hour, for 15 minutes each. And then we are going to have all of them together at your disposal for questions and answers for 40 minutes. We'll be closing right at 3 p.m. after our final remarks. So in this introductory presentation, I will show you our SAID mission, a little bit more about today's event and uh, what is happening during this month. I will present to you the panelists that are joining us here today. And I will also go with you over their content for you to be activated, properly activated before you have the chance of listening to them, okay? So here we are on our sixth mission. We are part of Brastiso. Brastiso was founded in 1986, and it is Brazil's largest association of teachers of English to speakers of other languages. It is a nonprofit organization with a membership of over 2,000 professionals. Brustiso is an affiliate of TESOL International from the United States, a member of ITEFL from the United Kingdom, and of the Southern Cone TESOL Group. And we are a special interest group that is dedicated to the study of mind, brain, and education, an area, an interdisciplinary area that gives a lot of input on learning processes. And our Email is mbesic at brustissel.org.pr. These, these are our social media channels. Here in our Mind Brain Education Special Interest Group, we try to understand how our brain works, eliminating false information about the brain and learning, the famous neural myths. And we also strive to learn how to better use all the abilities we possess using this knowledge about universal aspects of learning to improve teaching practices. We try to comprehend the boundaries of our individualities, turning them into enablers for the formation and development of capabilities both inside and outside our classrooms. We try to bridge the gap between the laboratory and the classroom, opening avenues of collaboration in the transdisciplinary area of neuroscience, education, and psychology. And finally, we aim to inform Brastisol's members and the wider teaching community about collaborative and cooperative learning opportunities within the evidence-based practice of the art of teaching. And with that, I now proceed to today's event. It is part of a celebratory month. Here at Prostiso, we are holding a lot of events and I invite you to get to know all of them. That is a way to celebrate you, teacher, during this month of October. Here at the Mind Brain Education Special Interest Group, we have carefully planned a very special event for those interested in the acquisition by adults. About today's event, we are going to have you engaged on the question and answer bulk part of our session today, based on the theory that our dear panelists will be showing to you on second language acquisition by adults. The panelists will offer a panorama on different aspects of this acquisition, such as how children and adults differ, how input processing and attention operate, 
and the role of memory systems in second language acquisition. The presentation will be carried out by our distinguished panelists who are all involved with mind, brain and education, offering us a very useful framework of research in practice. And please make your presence noted and your doubts heard by posting your questions for our panelists to answer. And if you have them, and we hope you do, type in the chat box during this webinar. I'll be collecting them, and then I'll be forwarding them to our panelists in the order they come. Thank you very much. And remember, certificates are issued through our registration platform that is simpler for those who have registered there. They, are, they will be sent to you through this platform. And now over to our panelists, I'll be giving you a short brief on uh, their bio and content. So first with us will be Rodolfo Macielo talking about differences between children's and adults second language acquisition. After Rodolfo, we'll be listening to Cynthia Sintabailer who will be talking to us about the role of attention in second language acquisition by the adults. And to wrap this up, Janaina Weisheimer will be, will be showing us an overview of memory systems for second language learning. And now a little bit about each of them. This is Rodolfo, I'm sure most of you know him. He is based in the city of Campinas that is close to the city of Sao Paulo, capital of the state of Sao Paulo, here in the southeast of part of Brazil. And I would like you, this is the abstract for his presentation, and here I draw your attention to this part. Please go with me. His webinar aims at the clarification of differences the second language acquisition process has between children and adults focusing on the potential that adult learners hold and how to explore the benefits of practice within the learning environment. Now about Sinta. Sinta Beiler talks to us from the beautiful region of Blumenau. She's in fact based in Gaspar, but she's a professor at the Federal University in Blumenau. And Sinta is here with us to talk about this part that I leave here for you. Come with me. As stated by Van Patten, although comprehension cannot guarantee acquisition, acquisition cannot happen if comprehension does not occur. Therefore, a good deal of acquisition depends on the, learner, on the learner's interpretation of what sentences mean. And she asks, how can teachers aid the adult learner in this process. And this is what she's going to be showing and then discussing with you in light of the latest research on input processing and attentional mechanisms. And now about Janaina Weisheimer. She lives, oh, in a very beautiful city <laughs> up north in the northeastern part of Brazil in the city of Natal, capital of Rio Grande do Norte. Janaina is a professor at the Federal University there in Natal and also a member, a researcher in the Brain Institute. And please come with me to this part that I have highlighted about her presentation. She will address the role of memory systems at different stages of bilingual performance. And she will discuss with you the importance of executive functions and working memory training for second language processing efficiency. And now with me for some content reactivation, which is adamant if we want the learner to be able to grasp everything that we are gonna have today. And you, we have lots of wonderful content for you to grasp. So the science on adult learning, what has it shown us so far? that adults are most interested in learning when it has immediate relevance to their jobs. 
Adults learn from reflecting on problems that arise when they try to apply their new knowledge and skills. Adults want to be actively involved in directing and in evaluating their own learning. And the social cultural learning theory tells us that individuals can learn best when they are provided with opportunities to, again, discuss and reflect with others, apply new ideas and skills in practice by, in practice by receiving feedback from an expert, and they need effective practices modeled for them. Please remember, this is a very important aspect that we tend to forget when we work with adults. Now, when you hear Rodolfo talking about the differences between children's and adults' second language acquisition, you will be directed to these points here that I have brought to you. First, he'll be talking about the initial stage of first language, how infants develop through interacting interactions associating speech to meaning. And by comparing that with adults, he's going to give us the points of differentiation between those uh, initial stages by children and the initial stages of an adult second language learner when they first base off their knowledge and mechanisms of processing on their unconsolidated first language for them to form conceptualizations in a second language. And Rodolfo will also offer us an overview on universal grammar features in second language development. Please, while you are listening to Rodolfo, keep in mind how and to what extent processes of acquisition for children and adults are the same and are different. Now, when you hear Cynthia talking about the role of attention in second language acquisition by adults, you'll be listening to her and watching her going over the definition of attention, types and systems of attention, and how adults process input in second language. While you listen to her, please bear in mind what is this that she's calling attention and input processing, which are these systems and how they operate for us and why, sorry, they operate and why it's so important for us to have attention always on top of our minds. And finally, when you listen to Zunaina talking about memory systems for second language learning, please, Pay attention how she's going to give you a great overview of those systems or dimensions when we talk about memory and how she's going to connect memory with second language learning to finally present to you interfaces of understanding for us to contemplate memory also in light of attentional mechanisms and emotion. And while you listen to Zenaina, please bear in mind what systems and dimensions are those? And then how do they operate in second language acquisition by adults? And what changes are we expected to see happening? With that in mind, I thank all of you in advance, my dear panelists, I'm very honored to have you today, for you to have accepted that invitation. We well know that it has been planned well in advance for all of you to be here today, sharing your great knowledge, expertise with us, all on a volunteer, voluntarily basis. So for this, I'm very grateful to you. And I extend my thank you and a and token of appreciation to all the members of our audience today. Teachers, congrats on your work and this very difficult year that we are facing. You are making a difference. 
Thank you all very much and please enjoy our afternoon. Rodolfo? Yes. The okay. floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Let me share this, my material with you guys. <clears throat> Okay, I believe the material is being shared, right? Yes. That's, yes. Yes, it is. All right, great, great. So first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rodolfo Machiello, or you can call me Rudy. Everybody calls me Rudy. Uh, thank you so much for staying with us this Saturday afternoon. I don't know if um, in the places you're in right now, it's extremely hot, but it is extremely hot in here. So thank you again. And uh, I know it's not today, it's uh, not until two weeks from now, but happy Teacher's Day uh, this year. As Mirella said, this year has been very, very hard for us, for all of us, okay? So uh, today we're going to be talking about second language acquisition by adults. And I'll start talking about uh, the differences that kids, uh, infants and adults have when they're developing a second language or in the development of second language. And uh, I separated these three topics here. So we're going to focus on joint attention in the beginning of our conversation here. Initial stages of L1 and L2, and we're going to wrap it up with second language acquisition and universal grammar. We're going to see uh, some of uh, some features of universal universal grammar uh, in second language acquisition. Uh, Mirel, I think the questions are going to be held for the Q and A only, right? Yeah, okay. All right, guys. So uh, in order to understand um, how adults learn a second language or actually the difference between infants and adults learning a second language, I think we need to know a little bit about how infants acquire languages, okay? Um, their first language. Uh, whenever we have an infant, immersed in a situation. So imagine uh, a kid, an infant, a baby, and this baby is immersed in a given situation. This baby will pay attention to everything around her, everything, every gesture, every sound, every noise, um, everything, everything that's inserted, everything that's in this environment will, uh, will uh, call the attention of this infant. And also the speech that is coming from normally an adult or caregivers, parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a situation, we have an environment and the baby is immersed in this environment. There's going to be noises, sounds, gestures, uh, movements, et cetera, and also speech. So the infant is going to pay attention to all these things and speech also, okay? And um, as uh, I know, I, I separated here, um, Lightbound and Spada, they said that in order to develop a language, an infant needs to interact with other people. And then you might ask me, okay, Rudy, but that sounds very obvious. Well, why did they say this? Why did they remark this part? And why am I remarking this part? Because we know that babies, when they're weeks, not only months, but weeks um, old, they already can recognize uh, uh, an artificial sound or a noise and a human sound or a human noise. Because sometimes we make noises when we're trying to interact with an infant with a baby, okay? So it's important to notice this because then we might think, okay, so if I have my baby interacting with a tablet or interacting with a mobile phone, then my baby is going to develop the language or develop um, uh, his or her speech. Well, up to a certain point, it is important to have a human interaction, very important to have a human interaction. Why? 
is this interaction super important? Um, I separated a couple of types of attention that we have. So we may have a selective attention. Selective attention are those that, um, probably you guys have that kind of student that sits in the back of the classroom, probably with earphones. And whenever this student hears something very important, this student removes the, the earphones, looks up, pays attention to you, and then goes back to doodling or listening to whatever he or she was listening to. So that would be kind of like a selective attention. So I'm going to the, the, the type of attention that we say, okay, this is important. I'm going to pay attention to this. Then, then as soon as this situation is over, it's not important anymore. So this is a one kind of attention. Then we also have sustained attention. Sustained attention is a type of attention when, where we uh, focus um, very firmly into some sort of activity or into whatever activity is in front of us, okay? And then we also have divided or joint attention. Divided or joint attention is key to the development of a language, especially with infants, because um, uh, according to what Thomas Ellis says in one of his materials, um, we have what he calls a referential triangle when we have joint attention. So the baby or the infant or the kid, the, um, uh, he or she is paying attention to him or herself, the adult, and the object that's being manipulated or the action that's being performed. So that's a referential triangle. And then you ask me, okay, Rudy, but what does that have to do with language acquisition or the, um, the development of language? Uh, did my slide change or not really? No, right? So Gambiaha is Gambiaha. Okay, so I think now it's changed. So why is this so important? Because based on this referential triangle that Thomas Alou, uh states in one of his works, uh, the infants are going to associate whatever is being performed with whatever is being said, okay? Um, some um, months ago, I also gave a webinar on second language acquisition, and I used uh, the example of put it up here. So normally when we have an infant immersed in this kind of scenario where an adult is picking up a box and putting the box on uh, the upper shelf, and then the adult is not only performing the gesture of picking up a box and putting it up in, on a shelf, but also saying that, then the kid or the infant, the baby, is paying attention to the gesture and whatever is being said and also the box, the manipulation of that material. So then we have the referential triangle in action, okay? So that's what infants actually pay attention to. They don't pay attention to whatever is a verb, whatever is a preposition, why? Because they have no idea what these are. They don't know that words are words. They pay attention to gestures, they pay attention to the object that's being manipulated and to pay attention to the sound patterns that the adult, normally an adult, but that the adult is actually producing. And then they are going to associate, okay, so um, this adult or this super big person is manipulating an object, which I think is the sound pattern of a box and put it up here. So. I think this giant person is manipulating this object and uh, um, changing the location from a bottom place to an upper place. And then the kid is going to, associate, to start making the associations with the language that is actually being produced by the adult, okay? And again, they don't know what words are. They have no way, they are not going to store in their minds um, the spelling of certain words. They don't know how to read. And uh, they don't have like a billboard or they don't have um, a, a notebook with people actually writing and uh, showing them the sequence of words. No, it's all about sound patterns, gestures, movements, experiences, 
okay? And they are going to store in their brains the concepts. They are going to start creating conceptualizations of that situation, that situation that they are being immersed in. And they are going to associate with some chunks. So for example, um, Professor Eva Dabrowska in her book, um, Language, Mind, Language, Mind and Brain, uh, she selected some chunks, some meaningful chunks that are very common to us, but just to show us actually that we don't actually um, retrieve word by word when we, when we need to access that chunk. So for instance, how are you? How are you is a big chunk, a big meaningful chunk. So whenever we have to access that sequence of words, how are you, we don't actually grasp how and then are and then you. When we store the representation of how are you, we store the whole thing. And probably we're going to actually have in mind uh, some sort of mental image of the experiences or of the situations which in which we use the sequence, how are you? The same with bread and butter. We don't, we don't pick up bread and butter. We pick up everything. Whenever we have to say bread and butter, we're going to activate our uh, neurosystems and we're going to retrieve bread and butter as if it was one big block and read a book, another collocation. So we have collocations and that's why collocations are really important because again, we don't pick up word by word. We go for the, we go for the big chunk, big meaningful chunk. And when we are exposed, the more we are exposed to the language and the gestures and actions and performances, the more we are going to um, improve our repertoire. And then our repertoire is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why um, social interaction is so important because we, if we don't have social interactions, then there's a big chance that the, um, the creation of this repertoire is, uh, is not going to be full. It's not going to be totally complete. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, good. <clears throat> All right, so hopefully you got an idea of how first language is acquired, how babies actually acquire the first language. And by the time, so let's imagine this baby is grown up and now this baby is um, a teenager or uh, a young adult. Okay, so the first language or the native language is already consolidated. We have already stored the concepts. We are, we've already created concepts. Uh, we've experienced so many things, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now let's imagine the following situation here. Um, this person is going to learn a second language now. So what this person is bringing into the classroom or bringing into the course um, is the whole linguistic background or the conceptualizations that, was, that were uh, created in tandem with the first language. So that's why we say the initial stage of a second language acquisition or the process of, of learning a second language, the acquisition of second language, um, it coincides with a consolidated L1 or a consolidated native language because we already have a lot of conceptualizations stored. We already have a lot of um, linguistic, um, linguistic repertoire stored also. It's as if we have just finished college and we're starting a post-grad course. So if we're going to a post-grad course, we're not going to forget everything we learned in college in the undergrad course just to start a new course. We're going to bring in all this background that we acquired through the four or five years of college that we studied. And it's the same with adult learners, okay? They have the linguistic source, all right? But again, this doesn't mean that the, uh, the uh, linguistic competence is going to match 
the linguistic competence of L1. The linguistic competence of second language is not going to match the linguistic competence of the first language. Why? Because again, they have a linguistic repertoire. They have the linguistic source for, native, for their native language, but not for the second language yet. We're getting there. We're going to, they are going to start the process for a second language, but they have a huge step forward in this process because we're going to use the conceptualizations and we're also going to use the linguistic source um, as an ally in the process of, um, of second language acquisition, all right? And uh, this, is, uh, this is why I separated this uh, uh, excerpt that uh, Jürgen Meisel uh, wrote in his book in 2011, uh, when he says that, depending on the way that we're going to start the process, this is, cru this is going to be crucial for um, a very successful attainment or not. So we have to be very careful with, uh, with how we're going to start the process with our adults. Because depending on how we do that, we are not going to have a very successful attainment, okay? Why? Uh, why did I say, for instance, that um, our adult learners are actually going to make use of their conceptualizations and the linguistic source? Because when they start this process of learning a second language, they'll need to seek some sort of foundation or basis to communicate. So what's the only foundation that they have? The only foundation, the only linguistic foundation that they have is their native language. And what about conce concepts, conceptualizations? They already have that, okay? All right, so that's why we're going to use L1 as an ally, as uh, some sort of trampoline uh, for the process of second language acquisition, All right? Let's go for the next slide here. Great. And then you might ask me, okay, Rudy, but um, you told us that repertoire is based on uh, um, some uh, meaningful chunks or collocations, con concepts, conceptualizations, uh, and not on words, because when we learn a language, when we create the repertoire, the words are not so important as uh, the, situational, the situations and gestures. Well, Yes, but then learners, because their uh, native language is already consolidated, they're going to use that as a the native language as a linguistic template. Okay, this is going to be, this is going to first, the native language is going to work as a linguistic template. And uh, this linguistic template is going to be important for the, not just the creation uh, of a new repertoire, but also we're going to see that it's also possible to share some, um, uh, some of the items that we have in this repertoire, <clears throat> in this repertoire with the new language, okay? So what are we going to do or what are our students going to do or adult learners are going to do when they learn a second language? So I believe you all, you've all seen this, uh, this toy before. So basically we have shapes and we have to insert each of these shapes into the correct slot so that the, sh the shapes <clears throat> get into the cube. So basically our adult learners are going to, they'll try to do that. They'll try to uh, get one of these pieces that we have here and they'll say, okay, I think this one is going to fit here, for instance. So imagining that this is um, a linguistic feature from their L their L1 and this is the slot that we have in L2. So they'll try to fit this in here. Well, it's not gonna fit. It's not gonna work. Okay, so it doesn't work. So let's try another one. Maybe, maybe this one, and then they'll try. So that's what, that's why I said that the um, first language or the native language is going to uh, work as a linguistic repertoire, uh, as a linguistic template because they'll try to do that. They'll try to um, um, make some attempts in order to communicate in the second language as they start creating, developing the repertoire for this new language, okay? But um, they're not gonna do this um, like, okay, so I have this knowledge, I'm going to transfer 
this knowledge to this new language. They're going to reason, they're going to think before they make this transfer, before they try to insert the piece of the toy into that slot. So it's not just um, a transfer of knowledge as much as knowledgeable transfer, because they are going to access, they're going to retrieve concepts and linguistic repertoire, and they'll think, can I use this? Can I put the piece of the toy into that slot? Is it going to fit in? I don't know. Let's try. No, it didn't fit. Why did it not fit? So we do have some sort of analysis. We do have some sort of um, um, uh, thinking happening here. It's not just because we have some linguistics, uh, linguistic source that we are going to automatically transfer these linguistic, um, this linguistic repertoire to this new language automatically. Okay, guys, it's not going to be like this. It's not going to work like this. All right. Um, so, for example, um, if they already know how to, that simple present is normally used to describe routines. So they already have the concept. They know the concept. Like, okay, I use simple present to describe my routine. I have a day, my, my daily life, okay? Uh, and then they can already do that. The concept is there, but they'll try to use some linguistics, uh, linguistic features in order to try to express that. The concept is there. They acquire that concept with the first language. It's already there. And the linguistic source as well. Because um, we do have some coincidences when it comes to Portuguese, Portuguese and, and English, for example. Um, the same with, uh, I don't know, probably there are some people from uh, Latin America here, Spanish and English, because Spanish and Portuguese are uh, cousin languages. So we do have some coincidences sometimes. And of course, they'll try to uh, make this connection like, um, I am happy. I am happy has the same order as in Portuguese, for example. So they'll try to use this template in order to express a feeling, in order to communicate. All right. Am I speaking too fast? If I'm speaking too fast, please, guys, let me know. I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow. No, Rodolfo, Hello? I was about to let you know that uh, we have to pass the floor on to Cynthia. So if you can please. Yeah, yeah, just grammar uh, and that's it. Thank you. All thank right. you so much. All right. So, and then you might ask me, okay, Rodolfo, what does this have to do with universal grammar? Well, universal grammar uh, in a very superficial way is a template that we are born with, like a product that uh, uh, we developed with our biological evolution, through our biological evolution, and that device that we would have in our brains would be responsible for putting the words together and then we'd be able to, to, to uh, create as many uh, sentences as possible in a given language, all right? Uh, well, we are not going to talk about this for first language, but for second language, we may have something similar, which is the template the template or the microchip, the device, the linguistic device would be some sort of the uh, native language. And then we might have no access to that feature, meaning that, okay, so I'm going to learn a new language. I'm not gonna use any of my first language, any conceptualizations, I'm going to start from scratch, which we know that it doesn't work like that. And then we have full access, meaning that, okay, so everything I know from Portuguese or Spanish or whatever native language our students have, I'm going to transfer it to uh, this new language, which we know it's not going to work like this because we do have some reasoning involved. What we do have, in fact, is partial access. So we're going to try, make some attempts, and then we're actually going to see where this coincidence fits or not. And then we're going to create a new repertoire, uh, to create a new repertoire, but we're going to create the repertoire for this new language, okay? So just to wrap up, so today in this 15-ish uh, minutes, we talked about the importance of joint attention and how these joint attentions are so important on, in, in the development of conceptualizations, and then how these conceptualizations and the linguistic source uh, are going to be so important in the development 
of a second language because, again, the beginning of a, the initial stage of a second language is going to coincide with a consolidated first language. And we have just wrapped up with the idea of universal grammar. The native language is going to serve as some sort of linguistic template for the creation of repertoire for the second language, the language that we are learning. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry if I was too fast, okay? But thank you so much. I think the floor now is uh, Cynthia's, right? Thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you so much, Rodolfo. Cynthia, the floor, better saying, the screen is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mirella. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Yes, cool. Let me just put my screen here to share. Just a second. So guys, do you see my screen? Yes, Cynthia, we can see full screen. Yes, you do. That's cool. That's cool. So again, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Mirella, for inviting us to participate. Thank you, Rodolfo, for, or Rudy, for your uh, enlightening presentation. And I am looking forward to Jana's presentation coming next. So um, I'm here to talk about input processing and attention in L2 acquisition, as Mirella has uh, presented before. So in our overview for today, we are gonna talk a little bit about attention, about the types of attention. We are going to also talk about learning, research evidence related to that, L2 input processing, and also uh, the final remarks. So uh, it's very important for us to bear in mind that the brain is always paying attention. So it's always paying attention to something. Right. In the same line, I have to bring uh, to Kohama Spinoza when she says that the brain pays, pays attention to different things at different times for different reasons. Right. So we cannot not pay attention. We are always paying attention uh, to something. And when we are living any experience, any situation in our life, be it different, be it uh, usual, we, our, our brain scans the environment, sifting through sensory messages to find something to pay attention to. So just connecting to what I have just said, we are always paying attention to something. So the brain is always attending. And when we are in our classrooms, let's direct this to, to our, our audience here. We are all teachers, right? And by the way, Happy Teacher's Day is coming, right? But uh, we are living this year full of challenges. And we know that sometimes our students are not attending to what we desire. So sometimes we want them to pay attention to some things or for too long and they can't or they are distracted with other types of information. So in this line, we see attention as the cognitive process that allows the students to control irrelevant stimuli. So for example, when you guys are now listening to us, so you are in, at the comfort of your homes, right? Maybe with your blankets if it's cold or maybe with your AC and some drinks around you, right? So maybe someone passes by and say something to you, you control the irrelevant stimuli. So you ignore the buzz of the conversation in the room or somebody passing by, okay? It, it's, it also allows us to notice important stimuli. So imagine we are in the classroom and the teacher is proposing an activity to be done in pairs. So you know that that's important. So you notice the important stimuli. And also attention uh, allows us to shift from one stimulus to another. So imagine in this example of the teacher proposing an activity, to be done in pairs, you are already thinking about your pair and then you talk to your pair. So you are shifting your attention from the teacher explaining while you say something, you whisper something to your pair, right? So attention uh, allows us to do all these things. And in this line, we start talking a little bit about types of attention. So according to Anderson, uh, we have sustained, directed, selective, divided and focused attention just for us to go a little bit deeper on each of them. So sustained attention is, uh, takes place when we focus for a long period of time on a particular task. So for example, you guys are here 
uh, watching us. So you are sustaining your attention. You are focusing your attention for the 15 minutes each one here is presenting, right? Or when you guys are creating your lesson plans, you are focusing for a long period of time. Uh, directed attention is when we consciously select a particular stimulus from all the stimuli that uh, bombard us. So imagine when you are in the classroom, face-to-face -face classroom, let's remember the beginning of the year when we were giving attention to one student who asked you a specific question or you were giving attention to, you are directing your attention to one student that is disrupting the flow of your class. So you direct your attention to that specific situation. We also have selective attention. So it's focusing on one particular stimulus for a person or, or a sensible reason. So uh, the student may select to listen to a whisper or to listen to a bird that's singing out there, right? Uh, rather than paying attention to the lecture. Or imagine your, your phone uh, sends you the notification of a message. So you focus on that because, wow, it's my mom. I have to check what's going on, right? We also have divided attention. So as we rapidly shift focus from one thing to another, so you, you are here listening to me and at the same time checking the cell phone. So you are rapidly uh, shifting. And the last one as proposed by this author is focused attention. So you, when you direct attention to a particular aspect of a stimulus. So for example, we ask students to focus on the answer to an essential question as they research on the internet. Right, so we may we may think about all these types of attention. And what is important? Oh, let me come back to something here. Um, that uh, they seem the distinction between all these types they seem sometimes a little bit blurred. So sometimes we cannot divide directly. We we don't know exactly if that thing is a directed attention or it's focused attention. Sometimes it's it's a, a bit a bit blurred, but it's important for us to know that we can sustain attention, we can direct attention, we can select, we can divide, and we can focus. These are the terms we, we should focus on. And here on this colorful slide is to call your attention to one of the principles in the mind, brain, and education science that memory plus attention equals learning. So attention is at the cornerstone, uh, the cornerstone of learning. So we need attention and I'm not going to touch memory because memory is uh, Jenna's presentation. So I will leave that to her, but attention is really important in uh, the learning process. And we have to think that learning crucial, crucially involves updating. So we are constantly adjusting our conceptual framework and beliefs in the light of new evidence and feedback, or at least we ought to, we ought to be adjusting, right? While we are learning. So according to Williford, uh, learning is the central part of the E in MBE. So in mind, brain and education, inside education, we know that learning is the central part of it. And for learning to happen, we need attention along with memory. So this is important. Let's see some research evidence on attention. So we have some researchers as, uh, as Posner and Rothbard, who describe the anatomy, the circuitry, the development, and the genetics of three attention networks. So in a very simplified uh, way, they talk about the alerting networks. So I have to be alert and okay, what's new here, right? Uh, the orienting networks, okay, I need to focus on this. And the executive networks, okay, now I'll pay attention to this until it's over because I want to know more about attention. So I am uh, using these networks to focus my attention, right? So when we see these three uh, networks, I have to quote here Posner and Patterson. It's 1990, it's old but gold. Uh, they say that it takes much more than novelty to sustain our attention. So we are here with our cell phones, lots of, of input, lots of information, but it takes more than just something colorful, something beautiful to sustain attention. So this is important to keep 
uh, in mind. And these networks, sometimes people call them systems, they are active, for example, when our class is engaging or when my talk is engaging. So you are here uh, engaging these networks, but they are deactivated when the brain is bored. So when you start yawning and you think, oh my God, this is so boring, your attentional networks uh, start becoming deactivated to this thing and you start paying attention to another thing. Remember, the brain is always paying attention uh, to something. So always bringing this information to teachers, uh, we should be aware that we should be structuring information in different ways. What kind of different ways? When you are teaching, you can uh, teach through discussions, to, through readings, through videos, debates, projects. There are a bunch of things we can do. So when we uh, instruct our students in different ways, according to, 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 to Kohama Espinosa, there is a greater possibility of student retention and learning because the information will be input in different uh, through sometimes overlapping neural pathways. So using different uh, ways, di different paths, and also different systems. So this is very important too. And I'm gonna bring to you some uh, studies on specific aspects of attention. So there are a bunch of studies that correlate attention and performance. So in this kind of studies, the question is, how does the ability to maintain attention impact one's ability to perform correctly? So this is a very good question. And for that, I want to check if you guys can watch this video. This is an awareness test. Can you see it? Can you yes, listen? Teacher. Yes, cool. So this is an awareness test. This is an old but gold video. Maybe some of you already know it, but I think it's important to bring to our uh, talk today. How many passes does the team in white make? Okay, so now guys, you have to do what is instructed in the video. How many passes does the team in white make? So you have to promise me that you're gonna pay attention to the white team and to count how many passes they make, okay? So let's do it. Go! How many people? Could you count? I hope you did. And? The answer is 13. Did you get it right? Could you count 13? I hope so. Did you see the moonwalking bear? Oh my God. Did you see the moonwalking bear? Let's rewind it. Go! So this is a piece of advertisement actually from the transport for, for London, uh, showing people that we should look out for cyclists, right? We do, we do not have any cyclists in the video, but you could probably see that you were so focused on paying attention to count how many passes the team in white made that you couldn't see the moonwalking bear there. Right. So sometimes when we are driving, we are so focused on the street, on the traffic lights and all the things related to driving that we do not pay attention to the cyclists. Right. So this is a video that is very short just for us to think a little bit about our attention. Right. Yeah, let me go on. Yeah. And while we are in the classroom, now bringing this uh, attention types into the classroom, we must realize that students are constantly conducting their own balancing act because they have problems from home, they have things happening in the classroom, they have their emotions going on, they have a bunch of things to deal with, right? And this effort impacts the level of performance they are able uh, to produce, right? And bringing research on emotion and attention, we know that how a person feels about the stimuli can influence or whether or not enough attention is paid to learn. So emotions are very important, 
right? And stimuli that demand attention are easier to remember. And for instance, you have an unexpected stimul stimulus uh, to the senses. So imagine as a very loud noise or uh, the use of a larger than normal text in a book or the usage of colors or highlights, right? This kind of, of unexpected uh, stimulus calls attention to itself and makes uh, remembering much easier, right? Yes, okay, going on. Studies on the performance of, of attention for uh, good uh, classroom performance. So behaviors related to social cognition in the classroom, like active listening, participating at an appropriate level, and knowing when to interject ideas into the classroom setting are important to bear in mind. So knowing how, when, and why to interact with others. Okay, so attention and good classroom performance. And studies concerned uh, with attention in the MBE science literature contribute to a better understanding of the teaching practice. So some studies take a look at how the attention takes place in the brain, and others relate to aspects of attention and memory in the context of learning. So in, in summary, very short, teachers should remember that attention is regulated by an individual's executive functions, but it, also, uh, it is also highly influenced by his or her social cognition. Going very fast, through the role of, of attention in adult second language acquisition, we have a bunch of studies that talk about that. And we know that during the process of learning, we go through widespread and pervasive cognitive changes in our brains. And sometimes the learner may feel overwhelmed by the input depending on his proficiency level. And selective attention serves to bring order to the chaos by sorting out that input, sometimes succeeding in helping or even overwhelming the learner. And as Mirella brought this quote too, comprehension cannot guarantee acquisition, but at the same time, acquisition cannot happen if comprehension does not occur. So when we are learning, we are making far meaning uh, connections during comprehension. And a good deal of acquisition depends on our interpretation of what the sentences, the, the words, the sentences mean. And we know there is a limit to how much information a learner can, can pay attention to. So while we are beginners, the learners use their brain resources to understand the words in a message. So the primacy of meaning principles. So they do not notice some grammar aspects. And gradually with experience and practice, information becomes easier to process, freeing up the cognitive resources to notice other aspects of the language that in turn and gradually become automatic. So a very simple comparison. When we are dealing with less proficient learners, they create new sentences by choosing one word at a time. While proficient learners, they create new sentences by using strings of words that typically occur together. Less proficient learners use their attention on the processing of meaning of individual words and the relationship between them. While proficient learners pay their full attention to the overall meaning of a text or a conversation. So when we are dealing with less proficient learners, they have lack of automatic access. So they, they need more time for the same processes that proficient learners have more automatized. So to wrap up in 10 seconds, we have to take home the message that the brain is always attending to something, that we cannot pay, pay attention to everything all the time, that memory plus attention equals learning. And uh, we should, as teachers, instruct through different ways, take into consideration the processes that different proficiency uh, levels are, are going on in the students' brains and the primacy of meaning. Although we, we want to focus on form, on the grammar aspects, students will always pay attention to meaning first. That's their natural process. So these are my references and this is my thank you. And then we go to the questions. Thank you, Mirella. Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very much. And now, Zena, the screen is yours. <laughs> Zena, I think you are muted. Just muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, can we can. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen. You're ready Great. to go. Great. 
So thank you, Mirella, first of all. Thank you, MBE SIG. Thank you, Brastiso, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here sharing not the floor, but the screen with my dear colleagues, Rodolfo and Cynthia. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, people who are watching us for having made some room in their busy weekend agenda to prioritize us on this Saturday afternoon. So thank you. Um, so as Mirella uh, introduced our talks, I'm gonna talk about a very dear topic of mine. This topic of memory is very dear to my heart and it's a pleasure to be here representing uh, these institutions and talking about this topic. And I can't forward my slide. Okay, here we go. Right. Uh, so I'm going to start by quoting Alan Badley, who is a very important person in the science of memory. And Badley has said that memory is the thread that keeps our experiences together. I think this is a very nice quote, and I think he really nailed the definition, a great, broad, but great definition of memory, which is um, one that gives uh, meaning to our life. I think without our memory systems, without our faculty called memory, we wouldn't be able to make sense of our lives. Our life would be complete chaos because we wouldn't uh, be able to build this mental map and this, uh, this, this model of the world that we have to build based on our previous experiences. And we wouldn't be able to understand our present and we wouldn't be able then to project our future or to anticipate future situations. So I think memory is what organizes our thoughts. And then what is memory? Um, Memory is a symbolic construct, right? But although it's a symbolic construct, it has um, a biological marker. So if we look at the brain, if we use brain imaging to try to understand brain functioning, we will find memory correlates in our brain, right? So neurobiologically neurobiolog speaking, memory is what? Is a connection between our nerve cells in our brain. Right, so memories are synapses being formed, right? And we can form synapses and we can group uh, circuitries of synapses and create learning, okay? So that's a biological definition of, of memory. And then I'm gonna cite another guy, another very important guy in the field, who is Donald Hebb. And Donald Hebb in 1949, he came based on his research, right? He's a, he did research on neurophysiology. And he came to the conclusion that when this um, neurons, they fire, it, they can be potentiated and they can fire together as groups, as circuits. So if we are, if neurons are responsible for generating behavior, if you group them together, you can get this faster, this behavior faster and more um, efficiently. So th this is, we're gonna see how this happens. Okay, so this is a very important guy in the field. So although there are seven, several different models of memory, um, the field has come to the conclusion, right? That there, are, there seem to have three, uh, there seem to exist three different systems, memory systems, which are integrated. And what distinguish these different systems is the duration with which a piece of information can remain in our brain, can remain active or stored in our brain, okay? So if you think of working memory, so working memory is a tricky name because when we think of memory, we tend to think about past experiences and we tend to emphasize what is stored in the brain, right? But working memory is not about storing only. Working memory is much more about processing. It's the simultaneous processing and storing of information for a very short period of time. So it's equivalent to what we call reasoning, right? But when we're reasoning, we have to integrate new information or new products of our mental computations to our repertoire, to what we have stored in long-term memory. So it's an interplay between the systems. So just to give you an example, if I ask you to do this mental calculation, which is here, 
So probably you're going to first multiply five times two, and then you're gonna generate 10. You are gonna save this intermediate product in your mind, activating, reverberating, while you multiply one by two, get to uh, sum the final product and get to the final result, right? So calculations, mental calculations are a good example of how our working memory works. But if you take, for us who are in linguistics, if you take reading a novel, for instance, it also works. Because when you read a novel, you have to uh, store characters, uh, plot twists, the, the, the plot itself. So you have to, in, to store these intermediate products of your reading. But at the same time, you have to use your working memory to solve more um, specific problems, such as, for example, disambiguating a sentence. So you have to be able to disambiguate, disambiguate a sentence. At the same time, you are remaining, you are uh, storing and reverberating these intermediate products, which are the characters, the plot, the setting, and everything, okay? Well, shortened memory, as the name says, it's the memory which you can uh, store for a longer period of time, but not permanently. So if, for example, you've just had lunch, right, some hours ago, if I ask you, I hope so, if I ask you what you had for lunch today, you can say you're easily going to recall this information, right? Oh, I had a hamburger, okay? But probably next week, next Saturday, if I ask you the same question, probably you won't remember what you had for lunch the previous Saturday, last Saturday, right? So, and this is very necessary because as Cynthia and Rodolfo were saying, our attention and our memory space is limited. Our brain is very limited in, in terms of energy and space, let's say. So it's very important for it to have um, this mechanism of being able to keep what is important and delete, disregard what is not important to save space, right? And then finally, but not less important, long-term memory is then the mechanism, the system which stores our learning, our memories forever or for a very long time, right? So then long-term memory is in turn divided into declarative or procedural memory. So just to give you an overview, declarative memory is the memory that you have conscious access to, that you can verbalize, that you can declare. So the books you read, right, probably uh, would be a good example of your semantic memory. And there's also a memory which has been the focus of intense emotion, right? So for example, your wedding day when your baby was born, this kind of memories, they carry a very strong emotional uh, content and therefore they are called episodic memories and they are, uh, they, they are able to be retained for a long, longer time. And procedural memory, which is very important for, for learning, and I'm gonna give you an example later, uh, is usually the memory we have of skills, of being able to perform a skill, right? So for example, uh, riding a bike, surfing are classic examples. You are able to perform the action, but you're not really able to declare, to explain to someone how you ride a bike, right? The person has to ride a bike, has to fall, try, make mistakes, fall, get up, try again in order to acquire the skill. So procedural uh, knowledge, procedural memory is a kind of memory that takes time, practice, takes a lot of practice and repetition to be acquired. And I think that sounds familiar, right? It's a lot related to language learning because we also need a lot of repetition, a lot of practice to, to master a uh, second language. Okay, and then just to give you a general idea of the anatomy of memory, of these three memory systems. Um, so the, the circuits that Cynthia was describing, the attention circuits, they are placed mainly in the prefrontal cortex, right? So we tend to say the attention is the door, the window for knowledge to get into our memory system, right? And this is placed in the prefrontal cortex. And then we have the hippocampus. The hippocampus has a pivotal role in the selection of what memory is going to be long-term preserved and what memory is going to be disregarded or thrown away, 
right? And very, uh, nowadays we've been um, devoting a lot of attention to the role of the cerebellum because the cerebellum is a structure in our brain that is known nowadays for storing our skill knowledge, right? Our procedural memory. And then I'm gonna open a parenthesis here, starting to make a connection with L2 learning, because uh, just for you to understand the role of attention and the role of emotion in memory formation. So if you recall the hippocampus, which I just described, hippocampus in Greek means seahorse, right? And that explains the shape of this structure in our brain. So the seahorse here, the hippocampus, is surrounded by the limbic system, which means that every memory that our brain transfers to the cortex to be stored or deletes is uh, filtered by our emotions, right? Good emotions, positive emotions, and negative emotions. So I'm sure everybody here remembers, has a case of a student who says, oh, I can't learn English because when I was in second grade, a teacher made me say, made me read, um, recite a poem aloud. And I was very felt humiliated and my pronunciation sucked and I'm traumatized. This happens, right? And this happens because the hippocampus creates um, a negative um, memory of that episode. Okay, and then uh, how, why do we think it's important for teachers, for L2 teachers to have the, this knowledge of memory systems, right? How can we imply, how can this uh, specific knowledge help us in the L2 classroom? So first, I think it's really crucial to understand uh, that, our, that a bilingual memory system is shared as Rodolfo has already pointed out, right? So, a bilingual speaker or a, biling a bilingual learner is not someone who carries two monolingual brains, as people used to think about some decades ago, right, a century ago. We used to think that two perfect monolinguals would integrate the brain of a bilingual. And this is not the case, right? Today, we know, thanks to research, that uh, our system is actually shared, our memory system is actually shared by as many languages we, we speak, right? And these languages, they have been, they are constantly competing for attention, right? As Cynthia said, and our attention is limited. We have to divide, select, shift, sustain, and all these languages in the bilingual brain are competing for uh, the focus of attention. So it's not, the bilingual brain is not a switch turning on and off from one language to the other, but it's a competition between languages. And I think this is really important for a teacher to know because usually when students make this kind of confusion, which is uh, the code switching, right? Code mixing, code switching. Some, I can still, uh, sometimes I observe classes and I see some teachers um, associating this with a mistake with making a mistake, right? And this is actually very far from making a mistake. This is, it could be a choice if we talk in social terms, which is not the focus here, this could be a deliberate choice, but this can be uh, the sign or evidence of very complex reasoning, very advanced uh, mental processing going on in the bilingual brain, right? So this is, I think this is very important for the teachers uh, to understand. Okay, and last but not least is the focus of feedback, right? During the formation of memory. So many teachers ask me when I talk about memory, okay, when should we provide feedback to our students to make it more effective in terms of memorizing the right answer, right? Because we know that in uh, creating a new memory or a new learning, the learners go through these four steps. So first there's the activation of attention, and then they have to encode the memory, the information, right? Um, and encoding can be associated to hypothesis testing. So this is when the student tests his or her hypothesis, which as Rudy said, are based on our L1 template. So it's inevitable, right? So we shouldn't tell students not to think in Portuguese because it's not up to them, right? They use this L1 template 
to generate their L2 hypothesis. And this happens during encoding. And then there's the storing, and then there's activation, right? I have no idea why this is in Portuguese, I'm sorry. <laughs> but then the student, okay, I know there's the, all this dis discussion about um, how we should correct students' mistakes and uh, what mistakes we should correct. But my question here that I'm trying to address is when we should correct students' mistake. I do believe we have to correct students' mistakes explicitly, right? And this um, author that I cited here, there are many authors saying this nowadays, but the hand points out in this very recent neuroscience book, recent book, that the closer we provide explicit feedback to students, to, to their encoding, to their hypothesis testing, the closer it is to their hypothesis testing, the most effective, the, the more effective the feedback is, right? Because if we leave students alone, generating and testing their hypothesis alone during the encoding process, during the encoding stage, they will very likely end up memorizing the mistakes, right? If they don't have feedback. And usually I notice that in class, what we do is uh, we wait for activation. So we wait, for instance, uh, for students to have a test or a task in which they are required to activate this knowledge, and then we provide feedback. But then according to several neuroscientists, this would be too late, right? And I know, and this is, uh, I'm just provoking some disco discussion, hopefully later, but uh, this is very important because we know that we are one teacher and we used to be alone in the classroom with what? 30 minds, 30 brains testing their hypothesis, right? So it's really hard for one teacher to, 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 to be able to provide feedback to everyone. But I think that technology can work as a great aid in that sense, right? So if you think of uh, technology providing feedback to our students while they are encoding information and testing hypotheses, this can do a great um, job. And I guess that's it. I'm looking forward to your questions and to the debate. Thank you for your attention. And right on, Jana, thank you so much. <laughs> and now we are with uh, some questions here. I'll start with the question posted by Luciana Ogando, and it was uh, a little bit before Rodolfo went on. So Luciana, later you can tell me if you want this addressed only to Rodolfo, to the panel, or if you want to add anything else to your question, okay? So she asks, what levels of consensus exist between perception, attention, and memory in the cognitive process of learning a second language? This for adults. And any of you, please, the, the, the mic is yours. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think it's uh, one is the consequence of the other because uh, first you have to perceive something in order to uh, get the attention. You have to notice like that there's something happening in front of the, talking about babies, they'll have to notice that something is going on in the environment in order to pay attention to it because uh, it's not something, uh, oh, it's uh, either this or that. I think it's a combination of the, these three things. She said, perception, attention, and what, Mirella, can you, the last point is, it's perception, attention, and? And memory, hold on. And memory, right? So then the attention is going to generate the, the, the memorization. So when it comes to linguistic uh, features, for example, and the situations uh, and conceptualizations, uh, there's something going on, the infant is going to pay attention to that, and then, make the association between whatever is being linguistically produced and the entire situation. Um, in the beginning of this year, I wrote an article for Brass Thistle uh, and the article is entitled, Please Draw a House, 
Why is drawing so important for kids when we're teaching kids? Because drawing is basically the um, expression of kids. Kids are going to express the conceptualizations that they got that came from perception and the attention. And then the, the kids are going to basically express that. So in my opinion, I think it's, uh, it's a consequence. One is a consequence of the other. Okay. Uh, do we have anything else? Cynthia, Zena? If not, can I go to the next question? It is still by Luciana. And she asks, what is the level of consensus between the first language and the adults and the adult individual's cognitive learning process immersed in the social space of a second language? Do you want me to go again? Rodolfo? So, yes, Luciana Ogando uh, asks. Because I didn't know it was for me. Sorry. Okay, so I will say that, that again. What is the level of consensus between a first language and the, uh, the individual adult's cognitive learning process immersed in the social space of a second language? Okay. Um, uh, yes, uh, as uh, Jenna just pointed out, uh, the um, immersed situation of the adult is actually going to be helpful because then the interaction is going to shape the language of this person. The, the interaction is going to uh, have the role of the teacher. So of course, as the adult is immersed in that situation, it's impossible not uh, for this adult not to resort to the first language because the first language is always gonna be there. And uh, it's going to be used as a um, uh, contrastive basis for the second language. Uh, what's going to happen then though, uh, the activation of a, a new linguistic uh, feature is going to become faster through time as the person is being uh, qualitatively exposed to the language that um, the retrieval of that, of that linguistic feature is going to, be, is going to happen faster but uh, L1 is always gonna be there. Uh, there's no first of, uh, because Jenna said, oh, uh, when teachers say, don't think in Portuguese, I'd say, do, do thoughts have an official language? Because I don't think there is an official language for thought. So, uh, but L1 is always going to be there and it is going to be the contrastive basis for the learning of not just second language, third language, multiple languages. Okay, thank you. Now, yeah, you to sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Yeah, like, can I just add something to what Rodolfo said? For sure. Uh, it's really important because when we bring the social aspect, we start to consider uh, the role of the exposure that our students have, the amount and the quality of exposure that students have, especially because now in Brazil, we've been discussing uh, bilingual education, right? And sometimes we read studies from other countries like we need we read canadian american studies european studies and ha they have a very different configuration of bilingual education in these countries and sometimes i see people and i see people generating neuro myths right mirella and exactly. transferring tra transporting the information they have in these other studies to our situation in brazil which is completely different right our bilingual education in brazil is there are many different configurations, right? And what we always have to keep in mind is that the social aspect will play a role. So how much exposure do people get, do children get outside school as well, right? So I think this is an important point to, to keep in mind. It is very important, fundamental. Thanks for <laughs> joining us. <laughs> well, I have here a question posted by Deborah Hassi Sinta. It was during your presentation. So she asks, how do we keep sustained attention of our students during lives if um, in general, they are listening to the classes and doing other stuff at the same time? That's a very good question, right, Mirel? <laughs> That's a good question. Sure. We have been facing this uh, shift in the way we teach, like at the need of an hour, right? We had to actually, in less than an hour, we had to adapt 
our way of teaching to new platforms to, to new different things we know there's there's this conversation all about multitasking that youngsters can multitask and do multiple things at the same time we have a, a bunch of studies on that saying that specifically uh, we cannot uh, use the same uh, the same resources, right? As we mentioned, and 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 Jana also mentioned in her presentation, our attentional capacity is limited. Our processing capacity is limited. So we can train, right? We can we can we can maybe uh, type something while listening to music and doing two things at the same time. But I cannot. Uh, really be talking to you and at the same time answering a message on my phone my resources are gone right so it's really complicated because when we are like giving a live like here i do not see you i don't know if you guys are really paying attention to me depending on the platform we use we can see people we can we can listen to them but most of the platforms are because of connection uh students are not uh, like uh, showing us the, their responses in real time as we do have in face-to-face -face encounters, right? So it's very complicated to, to tell you, oh, this way you guarantee participation. Sorry, it's not, it's not that simple, right? We should follow some principles. So we should, we cannot think of a class of 45 minutes face-to-face. -face. I have to give the same 45 minutes online you cannot sustain attention for that much of time. So there is, it's it's not a mere transposition from what you did in face-to-face -to, -face to online. So we got to prepare our materials in a way that catch up students' attention. So really use colorful things, but like, please do not give 45 minutes of lecture, you know, as you did before. So you got to put students in the, in, the, in the center of the process. So make them work make them put them in pairs you know in in the way you can do it in the platform you use right but giving lives is really complicated right because you do not get this response so i don't know if i answered Mirella, but i try to i think so because right on maria cristina cayano asked you cintia what about older adults those above 60. Mm, you mean in lives too is that continuing the question I guess so, but uh, yeah. let's wait and see if she has anything that goes against to that. Add, to add, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We we seem uh, to know that uh, youngsters who are more used to doing two things at the same time, they are training to to try to do two things at the same time. Well, they have they are more may be capable of doing these two things at the same time than older people who have not trained, right? But as our brains are plastic, we can train anytime, right? Maybe with, with older people, it takes longer, but training enhances, actually creates new connections and enhances pathways in the brain, right? So it's not that, oh my God, I am older than 30, there's nothing I can do. No, you can do, you can do much, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a matter of persistence and really practice and trying, right? It may take longer, but you can do it too. So, exactly. And um, pointing out, I think I can expand to all three of you. Uh, Deborah also asks, in connection to that, I will address the other questions uh, right after this. But because she posted that in connection to what uh, Cinta was answering to Maria Cristina, I'll ask that now. So she asks, so 45 minutes would be the maximum amount of time for lives? Hmm. I'm sorry, but I do not have straightforward answers because it depends on the content you are teaching. It depends on, on so many factors, on the way you are teaching, not only the content, right? So I just mentioned 45 minutes because of the regular time in, in, in basic education, right? But... It, it, it's a difficult equation to tell you how many minutes. We know that we cannot pay attention to uh, something for too long, so you get distracted by other stuff. So 
it's for kids we talk we say maybe 10 minutes right really we say like 10 minutes to change activities to change focus with adults that span maybe longer depending on their motivation on their interest there are it's 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 difficult because teaching is not an exact science right that we have clear answers that apply to all people and to all contexts so the social thing that jenna mentioned too right so it's not that simple I cannot tell you 45 or 40 or one hour or two hours. It wouldn't be fair to say a number like that. I don't know if Jana wants to compliment because I see her moving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if I just can just add something. I agree with everything you're saying, Cynthia. And I think something very important you mentioned is that attention can be trained, right? So the science of learning has been showing us very interesting things. First of all, attention can be trained. So, and there's something we call mental hygiene. So it's like brushing your teeth. You can start doing like taking baby steps every day in order to try to um, make your attention uh, work better, right? To have a more efficient uh, attention. One of the things you have to try to do is exactly trying to do one thing at a time because when you, share, when you divide attention, there's no way that all the tasks involved in the process will receive the same amount of attention, right? They will, so you won't be able to perform a test to its fully because you will be dividing all the resource which you have, which is uh, limited among these different tasks. So it's one task at a time helps and helps you also keep away the distractors, right? Because our attention is a lot about focusing attention, as Cynthia described, but also keeping the distractors, inhibiting these distractors. And this is training, right? And then the studies uh, about training of attention and working memory have been shown, have shown that um, it impacts directly, right? So there are near effects, near transfer effects. So you train attention, you get more attention, but it also has far effects. So you train attention and you get better reading. Kids read faster because you train attention. So there are near and far uh, elements, right? And also, uh, just to add up to that discussion about the time, yeah, I think it's hard to precise how long a life should be, but the neuroscience of uh, learning has been showing that the shorter the class or the period of learning, the better. So the ideal learning situation would be shorter periods, but more systematically organized, right? So that idea of having like um, half an hour of something every day, right? And then you should engage in testing and getting feedback in every single session not in the end of the process as we usually do, right? Mm -hmm. So every session should involve this um, testing and getting feedback as well. Okay, uh, moving on to our sequence of questions here. I have a question directed to you, Jana from Helen Haga. She asks, is working memory like the computer memory that you use to process programs? Is that it? Yeah, exactly. That is actually a metaphor that is used to explain our working memory, right? Because that's what the computer does. It process, processes information at the same time. It's storing temporary products of that computation. Exactly. And that's a good metaphor to use with students as well, because sometimes this constru construct is a little bit abstract for students, and then you can use a metaphor to help them. Yes, and we have right uh, next to it another question directed to you by Juliana Cruz. She asks, how can we keep the learner interested in paying attention through a process of repeating? They usually don't understand the point. That is an excellent question. I'm glad somebody has that question here because we tend to associate repetition with something bad, right? Because of behaviorism and all the criticism that we had about uh, behaviorism in, in the past. 
But now the science of learning has been mentioning something which is the new behaviorism. Because we've been finding out that the way the brain learns is through repetition, right? Through repetition, practice, and problem solving, testing hypothesis. So it's all that it was um, a lot of tenets that behaviorism and behavioral theories had are coming back when talking about the brain, right? Because the strengthening of synapses has to do with that, right? Remember I mentioned Donald Hebb? That's what actually he found out, that in order to strengthen a memory trace, you have to repeat, right? There are many other things you can do. You can associate it to emotion, for instance, but you have to have repetition. But I think that we've been, and again, with the aid of technology, we've been able to uh, think about repetition in a novel way, in an interesting way. So we've been able to associate repetition and surprise, which is a key element. And Cynthia can talk about more about this, but uh, surprise is a great element to uh, wake up our attention circuits in the brain. So combining repetition and surprise is everything. The one million dollar question. May I may I compliment just something? Right, repetition is important, but we do not we cannot think, in my opinion, think about uh, the parroting that we had in the Lingual method. You know, just like repeating something without context, without real meaning. So this new behaviorism is more connected to the social situation and also to meaning. Right, so it's not like just repeating over and over, but like seeing the same thing in a diversified way, right? So as Jana mentioned, including maybe games, including videos, different ways of reinforcing that information or that or, or that content, right, in a more uh, engaging way. So it's not just like repeat after me this that you know that maybe this is the way maybe some of us here learned English, right? So <laughs> we need to adapt. <laughs> Yes, always. <laughs> there goes another question from Livia Borba. Uh, I, I believe it is directed to Zona as well. She asks, do the memory systems deteriorate throughout the lifespan? Are older learners bad at learning additional languages? Older meaning senior learner, learners, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Livia. That's also a great question. And the answer, I'm afraid, is not very optimistic. <laughs> but yes, um, our systems, our executive functions, they, I wouldn't say deteriorate, right? Because that's a very strong word. I would say they decline. Our memory performance this declines with age, right? We peak at about puberty. And after puberty, it's, as we say, ladera bas. <laughs> it's downhill from yes. there. It is. It's downhill. <laughs> it's downhill. But there's a good sign. There's always a silver lining, right? So the good yes. side of it is that adults and older learners, they are also more strategic. So as our cognitive functioning declines, our repertoire of strategies and our metacognition increases. Mm -hmm. So it's an interplay of nature and nurture, right? I would say it's not okay. It's not a dichotomy. It's only nature, it's only nurture. No, it's an interplay. And I think most researchers nowadays agree that we have our blueprint, as Rudy said, we have our, the toolkit we bring with us when we are born. And we can see that with very young babies. But we also have this uh, plasticity, which is dependent on our interaction with the environment, right? So we have the brain plasticity, which is um, sensitive to our in interactions with the environment. And that only increases, right, with age. Yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> it is very illuminating and hopeful to all of us, right? <laughs> Above 20s. So uh, Priscilla Santos has a question about translanguaging. First, she says, Translanguaging, though, is different from translating and holding on to translate, translation itself. And then she asks, the former implies a deep structured thinking process, whereas the latter is just decoding. Is that so? Does it make sense? Is it for me? For all of you. 
Well, um, uh, yes. Uh, the whole idea behind translanguaging is that uh, a person is going to have um, a certain degree of mastery in a given language that the person actually chooses to use specific linguistic tokens in order to better express him or herself. So uh, it's uh, different from code switching because code switching is when we actually mixture everything and uh, with translanguaging, no, translanguaging, we deliberately decide uh, to use some linguistic um, features from different languages in a given conversation because it's going to better, we are going to better express ourselves. And I always like to use um, a song by the Beatles uh, called Michelle because in, uh, in the middle of the song, Paul says, um, sont les mots qui vont très bien ensemble, which is French. And Michel is a romantic song. And we know that French is the language of love. So he deliberately decided to use that part of the language or to insert French language in his lyrics uh, because it's, it's all about love. It's romantic. So he decided to do that. It's not like, oh, I don't know how to do that. So I think I'm going to use French because I know that I remember that in French and not in English, which is his native language. No, he decided to do that. It was on purpose. So that's the whole thing behind translanguaging. And something very important, translanguaging is not a teaching method, okay, guys? Because some people say that translanguaging is a method. No, this is not a method. This is a pure consequence of language mastery, all right? Uh, hopefully I answered her. I hope so. Okay. Um, any additional comments? So I think we can go on to the next question by Lorena Brito. She asks, do you guys, so all of you, have any tips for uh, education of ad, uh, young adults and adults, Asia, English teachers? Okay. What kind of tips? So many things we can talk about, right? Technological okay. tips, linguistic tips. It's, she just asked for any tips. So let me see if she complements with anything else. You know, just by, just by thinking about the context, right? Asia okay. students, they go, they work during the day and they want to finish like uh, elementary school or high school at night. So classes are limited, they are not long. Uh, they have very, very short time to learn contents and to finish a year, for example, right? As far as I am concerned. So uh, as tips in, in, in terms of teaching English, uh, I think that um, working on motivation for, for these students, so like uh, finding in them reasons to learn English and uh, reasons why they, they need English explained to them, because sometimes English is just a subject they have to to you know be approved at just to finish that level right so it's not simple like that we, we should make it meaningful to them so a tip i would give is make that thing meaningful to them so how do we do that talk to them get to know their context their realities their professions what they do and try to find out for which things they would need english so this way you were closer to them and by being closer to them chances are that you will motivate them. So this would be a tip, you know? I don't know if she complimented Mirella. No, not, not yet. But if I could, my tip would be related to what Cynthia just said, because I think um, not only why they need the English, but what, whatever gets the juice, their juices going, rocks their boat, right? <laughs> Everybody loves connecting their real lives to learning. So the closer you can get to what your students like, what motivates them, but not only to learn a language, but to keep waking up every day, what right gets them uh, learning. So mm -hmm. I think that everybody likes talking about right the the subjects that they that are dear to them, right? And I would also add that what we have mentioned before, which is variety. So I think there's nothing more boring to the brain than um, predictability. Yeah. 
right? So as Cynthia mentioned before in her presentation, our brain tends to get into this default mode, so, which is a, a mode of processing which requires very little energy. So in order to save energy, which is a, a natural um, purpose of our brain, in order to save energy, it saves resources. But this is not good for learning because for learning to happen, we can't be on default mode. We have to activate our prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And then variety, I think, is a good uh, rule of the thumb. So try to make your classes short, varied, personal. Yes, and uh, yes, I, I think this, uh, recognizing the background of our students is, uh, is something in, extremely important because remember in the very beginning of uh, my conversation, I mentioned that uh, we develop concepts. So if we're teaching adults or young adults in this case, they already have the concept, they already have a routine. So uh, what we're going to do is bring their backgrounds into the classroom or the virtual classroom in this case, and uh, because then what we need to do is to connect the, ling the new linguistic feature to the concept that they already possess. So if we use, if we recognize their background, uh, we're halfway there because the conceptualization is already there and they're gonna be like, oh, okay, so I already know what to do in this situation. I already have this concept here. All I need to know now is the linguistic order that I need to produce in order to express myself in a given, in, in this context, in this situation. So yes, respect the background of our students. Great. Okay, I have now a question from Priscila Santos to Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on dealing when it comes to special needs students or students with a low focus span, like an attention deficit disorder? Okay, so how to deal with them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first thing, we got to learn about the, their issues, right? So that we know what their limitations are and how we can uh, add, how, how we can uh, help them in, in, in the specific needs they have, right? We use this broad term, special needs, but it is too big, too broad, so we got to learn and as teachers, we know we cannot stop studying, we cannot stop reading, we have to be looking for uh, information all the time. So we have to first um, learn more about the specific situation, the specific needs, so that we can try to figure out how to help. In case of low, low attention spans, right, we have to do what we have been talking about here very a lot and really uh, plan activities that are short and that not not only short but they need to have a clear objective so the student needs to understand uh, what's the point in this activity so that he can direct attention focus the attention and do what is needed right so not only objective but also motivate this student to do it and we motivate by all these things we have been talking about here too, right? By getting to know him, his context, what, what his likes are, dislikes, and focus on things that makes that it, it helps making sense to the student, right? So with these special needs, this is even more mandatory, right? So uh, work on very short activities with clear and straight to the point objectives. This would be my tip. Okay, anything else from Jenna would, and Rudy? I would just, I would just add, uh, I, perfect, what Cynthia said was perfect, but I was just gonna add that the kind of feedback you provide yeah. to the students has to be even more explicit. Remember we were talking about providing students with explicit feedback. And I emphasize this because we come from a background, a teaching background, where during a long time, we weren't allowed to provide feedback, explicit feedback, right? Remember, we could only talk about content, but for people with special needs, um, for example, here we do research with dyslexic students and also um, uh, for students who have low attention uh, spans, they need to have very explicit feedback because they don't grasp the point of your feedback if it's too focused on content right, on the content of the message. 
They need to know exactly, and that goes with what Cynthia was saying about the objective and the purpose. They need to know it, um, exactly what the feedback is and what they can do to, to overcome their, their limitations. Yes, yes. And uh, not just for uh, special students, but also with every student prime. Because sometimes we uh, correct a mistake and we forget to ask our students to repeat. I, I'm not getting into the techniques that we're using, but our students have to repeat because we do have some students who say, oh, okay, I understood. You know, okay, so let's do this again. Let's see if you really got what was just corrected. So priming is also really important uh, just to complement what uh, the girls said here. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, guys. And now I have another question to all of you from Juliana Cruz. She asks, how to deal with those students who have very poor, uh, a very poor repertoire in the first language? Yeah. Yeah, I had, uh, I had some students like this in my life. And uh, well, in this case, when they have a very poor repertoire, uh, what we have to do is to work with what we have. And then the second language is going to basically uh, compensate with the creation of the repertoire. Remember, uh, Jenna also mentioned this, we're not going to have two different compartments. We're going to have one big compartment and they're both, and all languages are going to be in the same space. So then, uh, the second language or the third language, whatever language we're talking about here, uh, this new language is going to be responsible for compensating the repertoire of the native language that was uh, not as um, rich as this one can be. So then we're going to have a compensation, but uh, there is a big chance uh, that uh, it's going to be hard, <laughs> very, very hard. And it is hard from my experience. It is super hard, but they can get there. Exactly. Um, I completely agree. Um, and I would add just that uh, nowadays we know that the second language, as Rodolfo was saying, the second language um, interferes with our first language processing as well. Because until some time ago, we thought that there was only this interference or this transfer. Uh, now we don't even talk about transfer or interference. We talk about interaction between languages, right? Because that's more in line with uh, how the brain works. So yeah, there's cross interaction. So our L1 is going to impact our L2 and our L2, as Rodolfo was saying, is going to impact our L1. So one system is going to be a heuristic to the other. And that's very good. That's it. I agree with both of you. <laughs> okay, so can we go to the next question? Uh, it's from Analia Vogel to use Sinta, I think more specifically. She says, Sinta Bailey mentioned that less proficient learners take longer to process a second language. Mm -hmm. How can we help them as teachers to become more proficient? Is that related to retrieval and drilling? Mm, good question, good question. So we have to think of beginner learners as learners who are, as the real world says, they are beginning. So they are beginning to create their repertoire. They are beginning to learn all the aspects of language because we do not teach only grammar. We teach meaning, we teach pragmatics, we teach all aspects of the language at the same time, right? So these beginner students need input right? They need input that they can process, that they can understand little by little. It's kind of uh, Vygotsky's uh, uh, ZPD, so uh, input that is like in the zone of proximal development. So it's, it's something that the student uh, can do with the help or something a little bit uh, far beyond what they know, not too far because then it would be impossible. So we should tailor uh, the input we are bringing to the classroom. If we're bringing songs, if we're bringing videos, whatever type of reading we are bringing to them, it needs to be a little above what they can do with the language level they have so that they get challenges, right? Because if we bring only things that they can really follow and that's easy, they kind of get stuck because they do not have challenges things that they have to motivate themselves. So oh, I, I really want to understand this song, you know? So they put their attention to that. So if it's always the same, it doesn't help. It needs to be a little of, a little of challenge on it, not too much. 
So it's kind of a balance, not too much, not too little, right? So teaching is, is, is providing this balance to students, right? So by providing them input, we are, we are giving them uh, chances to improve, right? And along with this input, we are teaching them all these aspects of the language I mentioned before. So in some, uh, some, some teachers tend to focus only on grammatical aspects of the language. And then we have a deficit in the fluency, in the conversation, in the abilities of negotiating meaning. So I'm not saying we cannot teach grammar. That's not the point. We have to teach everything, language as a whole, right? So I think that's it. Okay, anything to add? Zena? Rudy? Okay, so I have here, um, it is more of an appeal from Deborah Suarez, and she asks of you guys to talk a little bit more about the correct moment to give feedback. Why is it that um, explicit feedback is uh, problematized? And does it work well or not with children? So again, explicit feedback. Why, why so much of a fuss around it? And how and to what extent it works with children? Yeah, I think I went through a little, in my presentation, I talked a, lot, a little about this, right? When feedback um, would be more effective. I think the fuss has to do with understanding and science showing us now that explicit feedback is important and more effective and our because it's challenging the previous knowledge that we had that we should provide students with implicit feedback which now has been this whole thing about implicit feedback is debated now the science has been uh, accumulating um, data in favor of explicit learning right, explicit feedback, right? But I understand that I think it's really tricky because uh, especially for students who struggle or beginner students, right? The more they struggle or the, the more beginning they are, the most explicit the feedback has to be, right? Because it will impact directly in their hypothesis testing. So the when I think I answered during my talk, which is during encoding of memory. So when you teach something new and they are building their strategies, testing their, their hypothesis, that's when they should have on the spot confirmation about how right or how wrong that hypothesis was, right? That's when, but I know, and I don't want to overshadow all this discussion, which is very important about how to give explicit feedback, because there's this, this whole discussion about not exposing students, right? So how can you be explicit, but not to expose the students' limitations or what is the, right, the, the balance between providing explicit feedback, but without harming students' motivation for learning? I don't know if you guys have a tip about that. Yeah, I yeah. think also there's, sorry, Cynthia, go ahead, please. No, go on, go on, Rudy. I go, I it's, go it's very briefly, uh, we do tend to, we teachers tend to think that, um, because we're going to correct, our students are going to learn. So uh, teaching doesn't entail learning. We have to remember that sometimes our students are going to learn some linguistic feature or uh, they are going to uh, create some sort of concept uh, outside the classroom. So uh, that's, that's why I think we are so worried about correcting, when to correct. If I correct now, they're going to learn. Uh, I think uh, that that shouldn't be the starting point. The starting point is, uh, as Jenna was saying, um, okay, so what's the best technique, the best way in, a, in order not to shame our students, not to put them under the spotlight and embarrass them? So this is really important. Is this going to be effective? Are they going to actually understand the feedback? Great. But please uh, don't think that because we're giving a feedback, they are going to actually learn that. And learning, I mean, they're going to get out of the class and they're actually going to be able to manipulate that piece of information that we have just given them. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect, Rudy. 
I agree with you both. And I think the question is giving explicit feedback without traumatizing our students, right? Because everybody here has uh, received students in, 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 in classrooms that come like, oh, I can't speak because I had a teacher that, you know, said that I, I don't have any chances of learning English. So we have to take care with 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 that and not like when but how so how we are uh, making that correction explicit so that they can work on their strategies and hopefully learn yes mirella yes i'm i'm trying to squeeze in another and the last question because we have one minute to close the session Yan is saying, since emotions influence our memory, should we just try to bring more positive feelings to their classes? Would that help the student to learn more? I have a, a very ready and big answer. Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully. <laughs> but I think I'm going to answer yes. I think it's a big sounding yes. Positive emotions into the classroom, right? Nobody learns when they are tense or right when they are uh, facing bad emotions. But I'm going to um, re uh, repeat what Rudy said. Students have their own agenda, right? So it's that idea. Remember when we bring a song to class and we choose our favorite song and then nobody really engages with our favorite song and they hurt our feelings. So I think it's the same uh, thinking. We have to, when we want to bring positive emotions to class, we have to keep in mind that students have their own agenda. And their agendas can be different, and especially if there's an age gap, right, uh, between teachers and students, their agendas will be different. So it's a lot about, okay, let's try to meet a uh, common ground on what is positive emotion to everyone, right? And as we were talking about feedback, and just wanted to go back to that and just say one thing, feedback doesn't have to be uh, a synonym of correction. Right, people? So I think we tend to see things like that, but it's not. Feedback is way more than correction. Feedback, if you think of video gaming, for instance, it gives feedback to participants all the time without correcting. So I think sometimes feedback is like giving extra material, right? Uh, suggesting a video to um, expand on that knowledge that the student is not building. So let's just, I just wanted to finish with that um, heads up. Okay, and now we are head on to closing the session. And uh, I have to thank you all. Uh, thank you guys, yes, <laughs> time flew by, right? Thank you all again for being here with us today. We thank Natalia at the backstage for making this technical, technically possible. And also please go to our DT channel to see the amount of opportunities you have throughout the month of October, free of charge for all BT members and a very small fee for other members, all with a certificate issued through the registration platform. We thank our sponsors here today and please stay with us during this month of October for more events and congrats on your work. Stay, hold on firm to your work, to your peers, to your students. We all need each other at this moment. Thank you so much. Have a very nice afternoon. Thank you all. Bye-bye.